Here are some of the first posts on the Wix blog back in 2011. Not exactly awe-inspiring, but give us a break, it was 2011. Fast forward to today, and the Wix blog has gotten a few upgrades and now brings in a whopping 1 million visitors every single month. I'm Kendall, a blogger for Wix and longtime writer for my own personal blogs. And in this course, I'm going to show you everything you need to know to take your blog from its own humble beginnings into something you and your readers will love. Now, good blogs are both art and science. And while I can't teach you your own creative method, I can give you tips and best practices on how to set your blog up for success. And so to do that throughout this course, I'm going to build, promote, and make money off of an actual blog. That's right. We're in it for the long haul, and we've got a lot to cover. So let's get started. If it seems sometimes like everyone has a blog, it's because pretty much everyone does. There are 600 million active blogs online today. And I mean active. Every day, bloggers publish 7.5 million blog posts. When you calculate that, that's 3 trillion words a year. So you might already be itching to get out there and join your 600 million companions, but slow down, because successful blogging means careful planning. And with that in mind, in this lesson, we're going to cover how to pick your topic, research your target audience, brainstorm ideas for posts, and pick a name. First, you'll have to figure out the what of your blog, and it starts with the topic. There's a huge number out there, but here are some of the most popular at Wix. But within your broader topic, you need to find a niche, a specific angle that you want to work off of. So for example, food is a great topic to go off of, but there are so many food blogs out there. But if we find a nice little niche like food trucks, it separates your blog from the rest of the competition and carves out a spot just for you. Plus, you know, we love food trucks. So that'll be the focus for the site I'll create to help walk you through all of the steps of blogging. And it's a good thing that I love food trucks because I'm going to be writing a lot about it. If nothing else, 20% of bloggers spend more than six hours on the post. Just make sure that you have experience with your topic because you want to set yourself up as an expert to get people to read what you have to say. And if you're still figuring things out, just be upfront with that too. Readers will appreciate the authenticity. And speaking of readers, you need to find an audience who's actually interested in reading what you're writing about. And not every topic has that audience, but there are some ways to measure audience to make sure that your blog will get eyes on it. And to show you how to do that, we're going to dig in and see if my idea for food trucks actually works. To jumpstart my research, I'll go to Google Trends. And you might have seen this site before, and if you have, it's because it's an incredible free resource. It shows what people are searching for online back to 2004 and can even compare search terms over time. So I'll search for my topic, food trucks. And from here, I can see there's been a steady growth and in interest in food trucks, which is a good sign. Plus, down here, I can see the top places where people are searching for this keyword. Looking at you, Honolulu. And something I do here always is that I look for related topics or queries to help me come up with ideas. So things like how to find food trucks near me or food trucks plus a location are things that I can definitely keep in mind when I need to look for keywords down the road. Next, I'm going to test out my keywords to make sure that I'm using the most effective ones for my site. So I'll compare food trucks versus, let's say, food truck reviews. OK, super interesting. So food truck reviews doesn't seem to have that much interest. So food trucks is going to work better for me. And this isn't just helpful when it comes to searching for keywords. This will also help me figure out what about my topic people are interested in. So here I can see that people are less interested in reviews and maybe more interested in finding food trucks near them. And that's something to keep in mind when I'm brainstorming topics. So how do you think of fresh new ideas to write about your blog? There are entire articles and case studies dedicated to the creative process, and no one has quite figured it out. For me personally, walking is helpful, and apparently there's some science behind it. According to a Stanford University study, creative output increases by 60% just by walking. I also keep a note section on my phone for when I find random moments of inspiration throughout my day. Like if I'm out to dinner and an idea comes for me, I just add it to my note. And if you're having trouble with that blank page, there are a few more methods that may help get things started. 
you might decide to share your personal experiences on your post. Because after all, a whopping 60% of our everyday conversation is gossip about our personal lives. Or maybe you could pull your friends and family, since another 60% of people say that user involvement makes content seem more authentic. You could also start by looking at trending topics and putting your own spin on it. There are dozens of other ways to start, but it's important to always remember your audience. What defines them? What topics interest them? What are some of their challenges? And you are the expert, so would you read this article yourself? Once you've locked down a topic, it's time to give your blog a name. So let's talk names. It's one of the most important aspects of your blog planning. So workshop with your friends, have some fun with it. And it's okay to take a few days to come up with something you love. Usually, I like to play around with my blog names by adding some sort of alliteration or riffing off of a well-known quote or pun, whatever makes it memorable. So think about it. Are you more likely to click on food truck reviews or truck it? Right, exactly. So no matter what you choose, make sure that once you settle on a name, you lock down a domain name ASAP. Now, we're just easing in, and it all might seem like simple steps, and they are, but they also take a lot of careful planning. The Wix blog didn't grow into what it is now overnight, and neither will yours. It took a lot of trial and error. So take your time and make sure that your topic, your name, your posts, they're all right for your brand and they all work together. And soon enough, your own humble beginnings can become the basis of your successful blog. 94% of a website's first impression is about its design. Not the words on the page or the post that you're featuring, it's all about what your readers first see on your screen. So your blog has to nail it. And in this lesson, we'll talk about how. I'm gonna walk you through designing your blog strategically so that you can create a great first impression and convert users. So let's get started. Design can seem pretty daunting. There's just so much out there, so many options, and I'm a writer, so what do I know about design? But I do know what I like when I see it, so I always start by checking out other blogs. And as I mentioned in the last lesson, I'm gonna design a site for my food truck blog called Truck It. So I've already gone ahead and picked a template that reflects my brand and lets my pictures of food stand out. So I suggest you do the same by just taking a look through the Wix templates and seeing what matches the look and feel you're aiming for. No matter which template you choose, it all starts with the above the fold or the first fold of your site. And that's the term for the first thing your readers see when they get to your blog. And it's actually a term taken from the original blog, the newspaper. They would come folded in half and the article above the fold would be the first thing that people would see. So it had to grab the reader's attention and it had to give the most important information of the day right up at the top. So the knee jerk reaction might be to throw everything you have up there, but be selective. The more you add, the longer it'll take for your page to load. And slow loading times will only frustrate your readers and make Google rank you lower on its search results. I'm gonna click edit text and type in my blog name right here to put my branding right up at the top. And down here for the first fold headline, I'll do the same process I did with the header and edit this text. And I want something straightforward so readers know exactly what they're gonna get when they come to my page. Scrolling down a bit right here is where my blog post will eventually live. But I'll get to that in a second when I edit my blog pages. For now, I'll scroll past this and over to my social feed section. Photos are gonna be a big part of my blog, so I want them to be featured right here on my landing page. So over here, I can click Manage Media and choose exactly what I wanna show up here. I can add a link so that if a reader clicks a picture here, it'll take them right to my Instagram. I can also switch up the order by moving these thumbnails around here and that'll update in real time. Perfect. Scrolling down a bit more to subscriptions, my rule of thumb here is that I never wanna ask for more information than I need. Adding more fields just makes people less likely to fill out a form. So for now, I'll keep it as is and ask for an email address, but I wanna add one more thing. So I'll click add new field and also ask for a first name. And since I want this form to stand out on my site, I'll edit the header by doing the same process I did for the header on the first fold to something that matches the vibe and the voice of my blog. Then I'll change up this button here to something that calls for action, like sign me up. But I also wanna make sure that people know they can reach out to me too. And so to do that, I'll edit the contact form here using the same process to edit my text. And I'm gonna direct this at food truck owners, but 
You can write anything you want here as long as it makes it clear to your readers that this is their line of communication between the two of you. And see this field title right here? I'm gonna customize that too by just double clicking and changing up that text. Just making sure that everything matches my voice and my tone all the time. And I wanna show you something super useful. Go ahead and scroll up to the top and click right here on this zoom out and reorder icon. It'll take you to this screen. And from the screen, you can click on any of these sections and drag and drop them around to change the order up really easily. It's such a huge time saver when it comes to your design. And each of these movable sections here are called strips. So if you wanna add another strip to your page, you can click out of your editor, click this plus button right here and add whatever strip you want. There are contact forms, there's a welcome screen or a meet the team section. So I'll go back and play around with my homepage, but for now, I'm gonna move on to some of the other pages in my site. Up here at the top of your editor under pages, you'll see a few options, but I'm gonna focus on two. Main pages, which includes my homepage and my about page, and blog pages, which is where my blog will live. I'll start with the about page. An about page is essential for your site. It helps your readers connect with you beyond just your blog posts. And if you're having trouble coming up with ideas, look around at other sites. You'll see that some are more inspiring, others are funnier, some are more serious. See whatever matches the vibe you're going for and model it off of that. For me, I'll add something fun. And I'm gonna put some emojis here to match the feel for my landing page because it should all look like it's part of the same site. I can also add some images right here to show readers some more of my personality. And I can either upload some of my own pictures that I've taken myself or choose from thousands in the Wix library. And there are some stock photo options in there too. So I'll search for food trucks and just pick one of these options and add it in. Let's go with this one. You can do that same process for adding video or whatever media you want. But once I'm done here, I'll head over to my blog pages. To get to my blog page, I'll click pages again and then select blog. This is where I can do all the fun stuff like customizing my display, layout and design, but I'll start with display. This dictates what my readers will immediately see. And I can choose if it will include things like a comment counter or a likes counter if I want that. And under that, I can choose if I want my blog to have a menu to keep things organized. Down here, I'll decide if I want readers to be able to share my posts to social media, which I definitely do. Moving on to the layout of my blog, I can choose any of these options. And if I'm not sure, I can click and see what they look like in real time. I want the focus to be on my pictures, and I'll also add a little bit of text to draw the readers in. So I actually think this tiled layout works really well for me. And down below this, I can customize everything else about how the screen looks, like how much space is between my posts, which size my posts are, how many lines I could have for my title, and that all updates automatically too, so you can see exactly what it'll look like. All right, I'll head down here under post loading, and here's where I can choose if I want my blog to have multiple pages or infinite scroll. So here's another good rule of thumb. Having page numbers is great for sites where people are looking for something specific, like a post or a product. Think about when you're shopping online and you know the shoes you love were on page three. The infinite scroll option is better for readers who are just exploring and not looking for anything specific. It helps them stay on the page longer and poke around your content, which is great for blogs. So I'll keep this on scroll down for now and have, let's say, six posts loaded at a time. But in case anyone is looking for something specific, I'm also gonna create an easy way for readers to navigate my page. Creating categories is a great way to break up your content. And depending on your topic, you'll wanna choose something that helps divide up your content in the most sensical way, but also offers range. So on the Wix blog, we split up topics from more practical things like small business tips to more creative things like the inspiration category. So based on the research I did in lesson one, I think that I'll have categories separated by location and region. So to start, I'll go back to this layout tab and click over here on category feed to create a new category. So let's start with creating a category for the Pacific Coast. The URL for this page will automatically update too. And you can change that URL, but I recommend keeping them mostly the same just for consistency. Over here, I'll add a short description just to make my blog super easy to navigate. And also, readers like to know exactly what they're gonna get when they're clicking through a site. Then I'll click Save, 
Great, X out of there and over to design. Back in the editor, I can go into every aspect of what I want my blog to look like by using this design feature. I can customize my font style, and for now, I'll choose something playful and easy to read, like this. Try to limit yourself to three fonts or less for your blog pages. Too many can be overwhelming and affect loading times. You want to be strategic when you're designing and creating your blog, always keeping that site performance in mind. I can also play around with adding borders and changing around the width if I want. And then I can click back again. And over here on buttons and margins, if you have any buttons on your page, like read more or share, this is where you could change up the color of those buttons and their opacity. So I'd recommend sticking with the color theme here because while you want these to stand out, it should also fit seamlessly with the rest of your site's design. Because no matter what decisions you make for any of your individual pages, again, you want this all to feel like the same site. So we just went through a lot, but here's the main takeaway. Your blog's design needs to do two things. It needs to make a great first impression, and it needs to make it easier for readers to navigate through it. Keep that in mind as you explore the editor and see all of the ways that you can customize your blog. And once you have that design down and you've created your site, it's time to start blogging. For a while now, blog posts have been getting longer and longer. And maybe it's because longer posts perform better and boost SEO, or because longer posts mean more chances to monetize. Or maybe we just have more to say. But as posts are getting longer, it's more important than ever to organize and present your content clearly and effectively. So in this lesson, I'll teach you how to write and format your posts so that they add value to your readers and drive traffic to your blog. Before I lay out and draft my first post, I always start with some keyword research. Keywords are words or phrases people are using to search for things online. So they can be something like food trucks or where do I find food trucks near me? We call the shorter ones short tail keywords and the longer ones long tail keywords. And you'll need a mix of both types of keywords to rank higher on something called SERP or the search engine results page. Whenever you type something into Google, SERP is what you get back. So by working on a mix of these keywords, you move yourself higher up the ranking. But wait a second, why am I starting a blog writing lesson by talking about keywords? because 92% of people using Google never click past the first page of search term results. I'll say that again. 92% of people searching on Google never click past the first page. That means you need to be within the first 10 posts on Google search or you lose 92% of your potential audience. And that's a lot of people. So if you want anyone to ever see your post, then writing with keywords and SERP in mind is a must. So let's brainstorm some of those keywords. I'll start with three terms I think will perform well. Food trucks, food truck reviews, and best food trucks. If you wanna stay on top of hot trends or seasonal shifts and add some long tail keywords in here, I'll add some more like best food trucks 2021, best food trucks to eat at this summer, and if I'm really looking to hone in on that local audience, I can also add keywords based on location. Once I have that slate of keywords ready to go, I'll go ahead and search for one on Google and see what pops up. Below Google's featured snippet up here, you'll see the top search results for your keyword. And down over here, you'll see related searches over at the bottom. Take note of these. They can help you think of even more viable keywords for your topic. And remember, this is just a list. You don't have to use them all. Actually, be selective, because jamming in as many keywords as possible into your article is an outdated practice we call keyword stuffing. Google has gotten smart enough to know when websites do this, and they'll rank you lower on search results. Plus, using the right keywords makes your site more accessible to those who are differently abled. So you need to make sure to really get this all down and download the blog outline sheet that I've linked in the activities and resources tab below. And you can see which keywords work best by going into Google Trends like we talked about in lesson one. Okay, on to writing. Now that I've stocked my arsenal full of keywords and checked out my competitors, it's time to write my first draft, and I'm gonna start with my title. My earlier searches showed that a lot of the top posts had numbers in their titles, and that makes sense, because in business and in commerce, listicles are actually the most popular format for blog posts. So it could be helpful to start your post with a number. And not just any number. 
odd numbered headlines actually perform better than headlines with even numbers. No matter which number you use, here's one to keep in mind. Aim for a headline between six and 13 words. And when you're thinking about headlines, try breaking things down into this formula. That's number question plus your keyword plus an adjective plus a promise. And that might sound confusing, but here's an example. You could do something like five top food trucks on Maui with Epic Eats. It follows this formula and makes readers wanna click and learn more. Okay, once you've locked in your title, head to your dashboard, click blog, and go right up here where it says create new post. I'll type in my text for my headline to match what we just discussed. As for my intro, I want one that'll let readers know what's coming. So I can start with a quote, a statistic, an interesting fact or anecdote. And I'm gonna write a Mark Twain quote here just to set the scene. Something like this is just a fun way to get started. Cool, I'm happy with that. From here, it's a good idea to take a moment to summarize what my post is about, to give readers a roadmap of what to expect next. Personally, I like to follow a new story model. And that means that my first two paragraphs sum up most of what my story is about without giving everything away. Then I use the rest of my space to give those details. It's my way of keeping readers engaged without making them feel like I wasted their time by putting some big reveal all the way at the bottom. And that's also part of something that we call at Wix showing our readers love. That basically means that we're keeping our readers, who they are, their wants, their needs, in mind when we write and do everything. We do that when we choose topics, when we format our articles, so readers can digest our content whatever way works best for them. So with that in mind, next I'll add in all my subheadings. This is a great way to split up and give your readers some options. Every time a reader comes to your page, they can either skim it or read it word for word. And adding subheaders gives them a choice to do either or both, letting them focus only on the parts that they're most interested in. Under each of these subheadings, I'll add the price, food offering, hours, my personal order recommendation, and an insider tip. So same thing here. Readers like seeing bullet points as just another option for how they can read or skim your content. After that, I'll add in the rest of my text, making sure that it's all in my voice that I've picked for my blog. Okay, while we're here, let's talk page length. Aim to have your post clock in at at least 300 words, but that's just the minimum. Studies show that the average word count of a top-ranked post comes in at 1,890 words. If you're feeling ambitious, Good news, because posts with a word count even higher, 2,500 words, earn the most organic traffic online. Personally, I have a rule called letting posts be as long as they wanna be. You can tell when a post is starting to get dry and drag on a bit too long, and so can your readers. So if I feel like a post is dragging and the story is as long as it wants to be, I'll end it. And another way to keep your posts exciting is adding things to break up all that text. So let's get into that. Images, videos, GIFs, infographics, all of them can help break up your articles so they aren't just one giant block of text. When you can, throw in your own photos because photos of real people have a 35% higher conversion rate than stock photos. So to put in some of my own, I'll select add, then click here where it says images and I'll choose the image that I want. There are options in the Wix library and stock photos, but I uploaded my own photos, so I'll choose one of those and edit it. This opens up my photo studio. So this guy's wearing a great orange shirt. And if I want it to pop a bit more, I can adjust the color by sliding over this toggle. And I can also change the sharpness of the photo. And there are a ton of other ways to enhance my images to make them stand out. Now, we're at the home stretch, folks, but before I hit publish, I wanna make sure everything stays organized. Next, I wanna add this post to one of my blog categories so that my readers will have an easier time navigating through my site. As far as categories, each of your posts can be assigned up to 10. So I'll click Categories from the left side menu. I created this specific post category earlier and I'll assign it to this post. This will file my story in a specific place for readers looking for content like this. And finally, I'll add some tags. These are words or phrases that describe my posts like Maui, Thai, fish and chips. See what I did there? I'm showing readers more of that love that I just mentioned by adding yet another way to make it easier for them to navigate through my blog. All right, let's hit publish. 
One post down, an entire blog to go. And as I said in the beginning, blog posts are gradually getting longer and longer. So writing and formatting them correctly is more important than ever. Every move you make here when you write and format your posts should make it easier for your readers to navigate through your content. Whether that's adding subheaders or categories, it all goes a long way. In general, the more you blog, the more traffic you get. But there's no science or magic number of posts per week or month that you have to be reaching. It basically comes down to your goals. Start out with one to two posts a week if your goal is to generate awareness for your blog. Try a more aggressive approach, posting three to four times a week if you're aiming to drive as much traffic as possible to your site. And for best results, as you get started, aim for six to seven posts a week. I know, it's a heavy lift but hardcore bloggers who publish daily actually see 57% better results than bloggers who publish just a few times a week. But again, there's no golden rule. What matters most is keeping your content fresh, original, and value-driven. Because remember, good content serves both your readers and search engines. Readers because obviously they want new content, and search engines because they rank you in part based on how often you publish. So here's the question. How can I make sure I'm publishing enough content? And the answer, by creating an editorial calendar. So let's talk about how. I use my editorial calendar as my way to plan ahead, hold myself accountable, and stay focused on my goals. When you're making one, make sure to remember to keep those goals smart. And that stands for smart, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. Goals that are too ambitious with unrealistic deadlines can be discouraging, and you'll just never get to them. Like a new workout program or training for a marathon, go hard, but go steady. Build up a habit for blogging that's realistic with your schedule, and you can always start slow and work your way up. For my Trek It blog, I created an editorial calendar in Google Sheets, but any spreadsheet can work, like Airtable or even Excel. Pick whatever you're most comfortable with. So let's take a look. I made columns for the publishing date right over here, Status, like research, drafting, editing, published. Post title for all of my working titles. Keywords based on my research and author, because eventually I want to collaborate with guest bloggers, but that's something we'll get to in lesson eight. I also have a comments column, and this is for my personal notes, reminding me to update content, to edit images, anything really. It just helps me stay organized and on top of things. In general, I like to spend a day planning all my posts for the month ahead but that doesn't mean that I'm writing them all in a day. It just gives me a roadmap to keep me on track for my writing. Of course, my calendar is always open to revision. Things can come up that throw off my schedule, a food truck can open up tomorrow, and I'll have to give that top priority. But bottom line, having this spreadsheet while still having flexibility is key. And if it's helpful, add all of that to a calendar as well so you could see it all laid out in front of you. So now that you have that, let's make sure that all of your posts go out on time and according to schedule. All right, as a blogger, scheduling my posts is a lifesaver. On some of my more chill days, I'll just write out a bunch of posts and schedule them to go out on my blog later on in the month. It's helpful in case I wanna take a few days off or if I'm taking longer on another story, if something slips my mind, or if I'm just not by a computer on posting day. So here's how I'll do it. From my main dashboard, I'll click blog, then drafts and select the drafted post that I wanna schedule. Next, I'll go to this Publish button, and you just click on that drop-down arrow and select Schedule Post. From here, I can pick the specific date and time I wanted my post to go live. And here's something to keep in mind when you're doing this. Research shows that the best time to publish to get the most traffic is on Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern. And to get the most comments, it's Saturdays around 9 a.m. For me, I want a little extra traffic, so I'll go with Monday, August 30th at 11 a.m and schedule. And don't worry, just because you scheduled it doesn't mean that this is all set in stone. You could still make changes. To make any changes or view your scheduled posts, just go back to that main dashboard, go to blog and click scheduled. And from here, I can click on my post to make the content updates before it goes live. Or if I change my mind, I can click the publish dropdown again to either cancel scheduling or reschedule post. And that's it. This is a short one, but it's a really helpful step as you get more into your blog. And now you're all set to start scheduling your posts so that you can hit whatever your publishing goals are on time and according to schedule. Just remember, be smart, establish your goals, and plan ahead. You'll thank yourself later.
There are 63,000 Google searches every single second. That's crazy. Just think about that for a minute. That means that there are 2 trillion Google searches every year. Actually, 93% of all online experiences start with someone somewhere searching for something on Google. So getting your SEO down or search engine optimization is crucial when it comes to your blog. And in this lesson, we'll talk about SEO for bloggers. So let's get started. To get to my SEO settings, I'll head to my main dashboard, click on marketing and SEO, and get found on Google. It'll take me right to my custom SEO plan. Now, this will only work for the static pages of my site, not my blog pages. First up, I'll enter the name of my blog, Truck It. Where it asks for a physical location, I'll skip this part since I'm a blogger and so my content lives online. Next, I'll describe my business. This is where I should use those trending keywords we talked about during part one. I'll go with food truck reviews, food truck tourist guide, and best American food trucks. And I could use multiple words as my keyword. I just have to separate each of these phrases with a comma. I think that's good for now. And there it is, my custom SEO plan. The Wiz tells me exactly which steps I've already covered and which steps I still need to complete. And I can click to expand each step to get a little more info, step-by-step -step guides, and some even come with a video to show you how. And it'll keep track of whatever progress I make. So I'll get back to these steps, but for now, I want to move on to another important part of SEO. When we're talking about SEO, it's not just a matter of sprinkling in keywords here and there. It's also about being smart with how your content works together. And that brings us to internal linking. Linking out my posts to each other makes it easier for search engine bots known as spiders to discover, crawl, and read all of my site content. Yeah, I don't love the name either. But these spiders help the page get saved to an invisible online library that holds everything on the internet. To create internal links, I'll scan over one of my posts and see if there are places that I can link out to another post. The key to internal linking is connecting relevant content in an organic way. Don't force it. That will only hurt your SEO. So let's try it out with my Maui post. I see under beaches and fishes that I talk about simple seafood, and this could definitely work as anchor text to link out to another post that I have about lobster food trucks. So I'll just add that link in right here. And make sure to leave this set to open in a new tab so readers don't lose their place in the article when they click. Another thing, remember categories and tags back in lesson three? So like I said before, categories are helpful for organizing content, but here's an added bonus. They also create strong internal links throughout your site and make your SEO even stronger. So don't forget to group posts. Now let's start personalizing. I'm going to go ahead and customize my SEO settings, and I could do this post by post, or I can apply the same SEO logic across all of my pages as kind of a one size fits all approach. So I'll show you how to do both. For individual posts, I'll go to each article's editor and click SEO on the side here. This is where I can customize my URL slug and title and description for my post. So OK, let's go in order. You can see right up at the top, this is what it'll look like in Google search. Under that, we have the URL slug, and that's what comes at the end of your page's URL or domain extension. So anything that comes after truckitguide.com slash will be my URL slug. So here it's Maui food trucks, but whatever it is, it should be short and specific. Keep in mind, URLs need to be clean and easy to read to keep them search engine friendly, and it's really good to include a keyword. For the URL slug, make sure it has dashes between each word in the title so that it's quick and easy to read. And if I make any changes, my slug will automatically update in that Google preview window. OK, next I have my title tag. This is the headline you'll see when you'll search on Google. In most cases, you can use your article title as your title tag, followed by the name of my site. But you can always shorten it or make it something that you think would get more readers to click on it. Whatever your SEO title is, just make sure to keep it around 50 to 55 characters. Moving on to my meta description. This is what readers will see under your header on their Google searches. So it needs to draw people in. And I want to aim for 160 characters or less. So I think what I have here is way too long. I'll shorten it to something a bit more compelling to get readers to click. And I also want to mention some of my keywords in here so that Google can highlight them in people's searches. 
Finally, I'll make sure the show this page in search results is toggled on and I'm all set. Moving on to the social share tab, you know when you post a link and it pre-populates with the article's image and headline? That's what this is. The first section covers my settings for Facebook and Pinterest, and the second section is for Twitter. And I think I'll shorten my title and description a little bit for social. Scrolling down to Twitter, I'll select the large card size to make sure that my post will really stand out on everyone's timelines. Now, let's go to the advanced tab. Your site comes with structured data by default, but if you want to edit that or customize it with meta tags, you can head over to this advanced tab. But unless you're an SEO pro, I'd just stick with the default settings. So that's how I do it for an individual post, and it's super helpful if you have a specific plan for a specific post. But if you want to create a plan that isn't individualized like this, let's talk about another method. Now, if I'm looking to save time, then instead of going into each of my blog posts and customizing their SEO settings individually like I just did, I could just use the SEO patterns tool to create one pattern or template that'll update all of my SEO settings on all of my post pages all at once. To get to SEO patterns from my main dashboard, I'll go to marketing and SEO, then SEO tools, and then head over to SEO patterns. Here, I have preset patterns for different types of pages, like blog posts and blog categories. Each page type includes basic tags that I can customize to fit what I need. I'll go ahead and create a pattern for all my blog posts. To do that, I'll go down to the page type and click Edit Pattern. From here, I can create patterns for search engines and social media, add my own structured data, and create advanced SEO tags. For now, I'll just create a pattern for search engines and social media. Under SEO Basics, I have the default settings for my title tag and meta description, just like I did when I did those individual posts. And all the changes I make will automatically show up in this live preview. Let's start with my title tag. I'll click Add Variable to see what my options are. After my post title, I want my readers to see my site name. It's good for promoting my blog and my brand. And I'll add a dash to separate my title from my site name, just to make it clearer on search. For my meta description, I definitely want to include a date so that anyone searching can see how fresh my content is. Two variables work for me here, date published and date last modified. I'll go with date last modified, that'll give me the most recent date to go off of. Again, I'll add a dash to separate the date from my meta description so that it's easier for people to read. I can do all of this using the same process for my social settings for Facebook, Pinterest, and Twitter. All right, on to the last important thing that I want to cover, and it's one of the most overlooked aspects of SEO. So let's talk alt text. Since Google can't actually see an image on a site, alt text is a way to describe that image so that Google knows what it is. And it's super important when it comes to your SEO rankings. And it also just so happens to be a key for making your site accessible. Screen readers use alt text to tell readers who are differently abled what images are showing up on a page. And with that in mind, let's go back to the Maui post and add some alt text in there. First, we'll click on settings. From here, I can add a caption to my image to credit photographers or add sourcing. And just below that, I can add my alt text. When it comes to alt text, I want it to be descriptive but not overwhelming. I don't need a paragraph's worth of prose describing the image. I just need a concise description under 100 characters that include some of the essential keywords we talked about earlier. Also, no need to start alt text with a picture of or an image of, just get straight to what's in the photo. So for this image, I'm gonna go with the name of the food truck, the type of food, and its location. And then I'm good to go. It's an easy step, but it's also super important for getting found on Google. Keep in mind that while SEO might not be the most fun part of writing a blog, it's still essential if you wanna break through those two trillion Google searches a year. And be patient. Climbing up the search results means establishing yourself, and that takes time. There are 4.3 billion active social media users all over the world. That's more than half of the world's population, or 65% of the people over 13 years old. So with all of those users, how do you make sure that your blog content gets in front of the right ones and attracts the right attention? In this lesson, we'll cover just that. I'll walk you through how to identify the right social media platforms for your blog, 
create really eye-catching posts, and then I'll go ahead and promote some of my own content on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to show you how. Let's get started. If you want your blog to get noticed, and of course you do, then you need to have a strong presence on social media. And getting users engaged starts with engaging yourself. So here are some of my tips and best practices for getting started. First, find your blog's communities. And I'm not talking about starting your own just yet. See what's already out there. Join Facebook groups that cover similar topics, follow Instagram influencers in your market, or search for Twitter hashtags that are popular in your niche. And don't just look around, actually engage. That means commenting on posts about your topic, retweeting content you like, and reaching out to other bloggers and readers in the community. It'll help you become part of the conversation and get noticed. You can also use social media as a way to stay updated on news and collect inspiration from your industry. So if everyone's talking about that trendy new Michelin star Mexican restaurant, maybe it's time for Truckit to post about that awesome taco truck I reviewed last month. Because the articles you post on social don't necessarily have to be your newest ones. They just have to fit the moment. Also remember, social media moves fast and topics and trends are always changing. So make sure to check in often with your social networks. Dedicate some time every week to engaging with your online communities and catching up with industry news. It'll help keep your posts relevant. So now that you're engaged with other posts, I'll walk you through how to create some of your own. A good strategy starts with identifying which social media platforms best match your content and your target audience. So let's start with Instagram. For posts that rely on graphics and photos, Instagram is your best bet. And the largest demographic here is 25 to 34 year olds. That's the same for Facebook, where it's all about starting a conversation. So there you should focus on posts that foster some type of discussion. And Twitter, that platform works best for posts that are more timely, like if they're related to current events or news in your industry. But heads up here, before you go investing all of your time in Twitter, just make sure that it's the right fit for your target audience. Because of the 187 million active daily users on Twitter, 70% are male and only 30% are female. So that's something to consider. Also, don't worry, you don't have to just pick one platform. You can always change it up or do any combination. The main goal here is to just make sure that you cater each post to the platform that you're posting on. Don't just blanket post all three. For me, when I'm deciding where to post, it helps me to think, would I engage with the post myself? And if I did, where would I do it? And when I'm deciding what to post, it doesn't always have to be my latest article. I can always refresh a headline or post an older article again if it fits the moment or has already performed well. So after doing some research, I've decided that I wanna promote my Trekit post to all three platforms. And here's how I'll do that. This next part is pretty simple, so I'll just quickly speed through it before we get to the good stuff. Right from my dashboard, take any post and click the three dots and choose share post. For now, I'll start with Twitter. Now, since I'm already logged into Twitter, everything is already right there. My link, my cover image, SEO title and description, and I can customize any of that right now as long as it's under 280 characters. But I actually think this is good as is, so I'll just hit tweet. And it's the same process for Facebook. Just click on that icon and press share. But if you wanna step it up a bit, there's a tool that can give your images that extra boost to really make them pop on social media timelines. Let me show you how to do that. Good looking, eye-catching graphics are super important for attracting attention on social media. Actually, on average, posts with images get three times more engagement than posts without. And there's a tool called Social Post built right into your site. And I'm gonna make one to walk you through it. So from the main dashboard, click Marketing and SEO, and then Social Posts. Here you'll find a ton of design and made templates, and they're updated regularly to match seasons and trends. But I'll go ahead and start with a blank slate to show you everything you can do. From the editor, I can do things like change up the font. I'll pick one that's bold and easily readable with some of those emojis that I used on my landing page for branding. Then I'll write new post here, just to make it clear what I'm talking about. I'll write in read now also, and for this main text, I'll keep it short and I'll explain why. When you post on social, you only have a few milliseconds to grab someone's attention. Keeping your text short helps with that, and if you wanna add more text, there's plenty of room to do that in the caption. Now that we have the text down, let's do some design. 
I'll change the background color to match the look of my blog so that everything seems cohesive and has the same branding and overall vibe. I want people to see this and immediately recognize it as a Trekit post. Then I'll drop in some graphic elements. I'll just click this button of text right under here, choose the image I want from my library and add that right in. I'll also add my logo right at the top just to put some more of my branding in here. And then I'll add some shapes. Putting a box around read now makes it look like a button. So it shows people that there's an action that I want them to take from this post. This looks awesome. And it looks like a natural extension of my blog's branding. So all I have to do is click next, preview my post and download it. I can connect my Facebook page and share it right to my Facebook. But for Instagram, I'll have to download the post myself. So I'll choose my country and add my phone number. And there it is a text with a link to the image sent right to my phone. Now I could save it to my photos and add it right to Instagram. And I just wanna leave you with one last tip before I go. If you haven't done this yet, make a Facebook business page for your blog now. It's not just a good step for creating a community and sharing your latest posts. It'll also help you monetize your blog and connect with other bloggers later on. So we've covered just a few of the most effective ways to promote your blog on social media. And you don't need to put all of your posts in front of all 4.3 billion of those active social media users. You just need to get them in front of the right ones. So be strategic and use all of your tools to your advantage. And remember, keep building those social communities. Gmail, Outlook, AOL, Yahoo, let's talk about email. You have it, I have it. In fact, 4 billion people around the world use email. No surprise that communicating over email is absolutely essential for running your blog and expanding your reach. So in this lesson, I'll teach you everything you need to know to run smart email campaigns. We'll go through how to connect with new subscribers using an automatic welcome email, highlight some of your top content with newsletters, and notify readers each time a new post drops. Let's get started. Remember back in lesson two when we talked about adding a subscription form to your blog? Your site automatically saves everyone who filled this out into your contact list. So I can go ahead and access that list now. From my main dashboard, I'll click contacts here, and that'll bring me to this list, which includes subscribers, readers who reached out directly through the contact form, and even customers who brought Trekit swag. And I can filter them. So for now, I'll click subscribe status and then subscribe to see who actually signed up for my content. And I'll tell you why. Email subscribers are three and a half times more likely to share your content than other readers. So I wanna make sure that I take care of them and make sure that they are having a solid experience. So with that in mind, let's set up this email automation. As soon as readers subscribe, I wanna send them an email right away while I'm top of mind. So I want my blog to automatically send a confirmation. I only have to set this up once and then the email is good to go anytime I get a new subscriber. I'll click CRM tools over here and then automations. Under build customer relationships, there's a button that says send thank you emails to visitors that submit. Select that and click use this automation. Now when creating an automation, there are three main parts, the trigger, the action and the timing. The trigger is what a user does on your site that sets everything in motion, like clicking subscribe. The action is the thing that happens once the trigger is activated, like sending an email. And the timing is how often or when you want this action to occur. So naturally, let's start with the trigger. Click on the dropdown and you'll see the trigger is already set to when visitor submits a form. Works for me, but you can choose whatever you want here. For trigger every time, I'll set it to where it says visitor submits a form. Next, I can select which specific form triggers the automation. In this case, I want my email to link up to my subscription forms on both my homepage and my individual post pages. All right, the trigger is all set, so next up is the action. This is what I want the automation to actually do. Send emails to contacts pre-selected, great. But if you're looking for something else, there are a ton of other options here. Under here where it says customize your sender details, my from name and my reply to email are already filled in. And make sure to make this personal and add in your own name or your blogs. Because the average person receives 121 emails every day. That's more than 44,000 emails every year and one busy inbox. So half the battle is breaking through all that noise. And making it seem like it's actually from a person is really helpful for that. 
So with that in mind, let's head to create your email. Here you can customize the content, look, and feel of the automated email so that it reflects your brand. Click Edit Template, and first I'll edit my subject line. I'll go with something straightforward for now, like thanks for subscribing to Truck It, so they'll know exactly why they're receiving this email, and then I can get a bit more creative later on when I send them email updates now that they recognize me. Since I asked for my subscriber's name on my contact form, I can add dynamic values and personalize each subject line with the reader's name, and that usually helps boost open rates. When it comes to writing subject lines, a good benchmark to know your emails are working well is that your email should have a 20% open rate. Anything less means that your subject line wasn't compelling enough. And another fun fact, emails sent on Tuesday usually have a higher open rate than the rest of the week, and mornings always work best. Next up, the body of the email. At the top of my email, I want to add my logo. So I'll click here to change the image, and I'll pick my logo from my folder that's already in here. Then add a link so that readers can click it and get right to my homepage. In my email header, I'll welcome readers and let them know that they're now on my subscriber list. I like saying they're on the list because it gives some sort of exclusivity to it. I'm going to go with Helvetica and 48 pixels so that it's readable everywhere and will work on any computer or phone. Then for my body text, you want this to be conversational and exciting. So thank people for subscribing and give them a taste of what they can expect to come. As a closer here, I want to include a call to action or CTA that pulls my readers back into my site somehow, because that's the main goal here, bringing them back to the page. It can be anything you want, but make it logical. Think about it for a second. They just signed on. What do your readers want to do now? Since my blog includes a store that lets them buy Truck It swag, and we'll talk about that in Lesson 14, maybe they'll want to celebrate their subscription, so I'll use that as my chance to create a call for action. And now that we have the text for the body of this email, it's time to spruce up the actual design as well. So I'll change out the fonts and the colors, and I'll go with Helvetica here again. And I can also change the background color to match the colors of my blog and keep that branding going. And down in the footer, I'm also able to link out to my own social pages and encourage people to share on theirs. And I'll make sure that my website link actually goes back to my page. So I'll do that by clicking right here and adding a link right in. OK, done. Now that we've drafted an automated email for new subscribers, I'll click Save and Publish to see what I've created. And I can't stress this next step enough. Test your emails out before you send them to readers, on desktop and on mobile. Make sure it looks the way you want, check for spelling mistakes, test out links to assure they lead you where you want them to. This is their first impression of what it's like to be a subscriber on your blog, so you don't want to start it off with an embarrassing mistake. To do that, I'll hit Preview and Test, Send Test Email, and type in your own email address, and then click Send. Now, the final component for your automated email is timing. This automation is scheduled for immediately after trigger. Great, but if you want to delay this email, go to Choose a Time to send this action and click Set Custom Time and choose whatever you want. Under Limit Frequency 2, I'll select Once Per Contact. And there, my email automation is all set. OK, now let's create a newsletter. To create an email newsletter, I'll have to go back to my main dashboard, click Marketing and SEO, and then Email Marketing. A few templates will pop up right away, and they're usually related to upcoming holidays or trends, and I'll select this one and start editing. If this screen looks familiar, it's because the setup and the features for email marketing are exactly the same as what we just used for email automation. So again, for my main header here, I'll change it to something short and informative that clearly represents your brand so that people know it's you. This header may seem a little short, but the average person only spends 13.4 seconds on a single email before moving on. So it's really important to relay a lot of information pretty quickly, keeping this in mind as we head into the email subheader. I'll do something fun right up here and play off some seasonal trends to make sure that this is relevant no matter who's receiving the email and where they are in the country. As far as this picture, I can change it up, but I'm actually going to delete this to minimize the amount of scrolling my readers will have to do on their phones. And just to show how much you could change up this template and to minimize that scroll again, I'll delete this big chunk of text right here, too. I'll put in a header for my first article here and a description. And remember as I do this, this is not your blog post. 
Don't go too long here. Just give them a taste of what's to come, enough to drive them back to your site for more, because again, that's the goal. Then I'll change the image here, choosing one from my library. And down here, I'll click on the CTA, and I can change up the content to say, read more. And then I'll click over to design, and I'll change the text color to black, the fill color to white, and the border color back to black. And while I'm at it, I want these lines to match too. So I'm gonna go ahead and click one, click design, and change that to black too. So now I wanna add another section here. So I'll click on add, then columns, and choose this layout. And I'll drag this down under here, under what I already have written. Now you can repeat the same steps to add another section and change up anything else you want. And once you're done, up top, I have a desktop and mobile icon that lets me preview my email from both devices. And again, don't forget to check mobile. 80% of people navigate the internet on their phones, and it can be easy to forget that when you're creating something on desktop or on a laptop. I'll click send test email, add my personal address in the send to field and click send. And after a quick check, I'll click back to editing, next, and select which of my contacts I wanna send this email to. I'll keep my toggle set to only show active contacts and then under labels, I'll select all and click next. Finally, this is where I can edit my subject line, add a dynamic value like a subscriber's name and check that my from name and reply to email are all correct. I want this email subject line to stand out in my reader's inboxes. So I think something like this could work. Then click send now to blast out your email marketing campaign. Or you can also set the date and time for a future newsletter if you wanna send it later. I'll click schedule email, select this coming Tuesday at 11 a.m. and then schedule campaign. How often you send your newsletter to subscribers is entirely up to you, but just keep in mind, more than once a week could annoy your subscribers, but less than once a month could cause them to forget about you entirely. But what about the times when you wanna send an email that's not part of your monthly newsletter? Let's get into that. A final way to keep up your relationship with your readers is to send out an email every time you have a new post. Now, I only suggest this if you post periodically. If you're posting daily, skip this. It'll only annoy your readers. To create an email marketing campaign for a single post, I'll select the post I want for my blog and choose Create Email Campaign. Just like my automation and newsletter, I can customize this email any way I want. What's different is that my email comes pre-populated with my blog post title and preview text from the article itself. But same thing here. Once you're done, just check that everything is good to go and either send it or schedule it. That was a lot, so just to review. Today, we ran through how to send welcome emails, monthly newsletters, and new content announcements. And each are essential for building your following, nurturing your communities, connecting with readers, and ultimately growing your blog. Let's say you write an article and you publish it to your blog. You obviously share it with your social media platforms and fill out your SEO info, but how far of a reach does your blog post really have? Now, let's say you write that same exact post and then let's say that you send it to your blogger friend. They share it with their following, which also includes some bloggers who comment, like, and share it with their followers, and suddenly you get the point. This is why professional bloggers say that connecting with other bloggers isn't just important. It's the single most effective way to turn your blog into a successful brand. In this lesson, I'll walk you through some best practices and share some of my own methods for building relationships with other bloggers that'll help boost your credibility, reach, and search engine ranking. Let's get started. It's all about who you know, and the same goes for your blog. So you wanna surround yourself with the right people. And that's not just because I want you to make friends, it's because of something every blogger should know about called EAT. EAT is an essential part of how Google ranks websites on its search results. And it stands for expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. And it means you have to have all three of these things to rank high on Google search results. And how important is it? Important enough that Google mentions EAT 135 times on its search quality guidelines. So yeah, pretty important. Stuffing your post with keywords is no longer enough to break through the noise. Google's smarter than that and knows how to identify content that's worthy of readers' time. 
So to really climb the search rankings, you have to be an expert in your field. And cementing that authority means connecting with other bloggers that readers trust. It starts with finding your people. And by people, I mean bloggers in your field who are already proving their eat. I always start with the Google search and see which blogs are showing up as the top results. That's what I use as an indicator that these are the blogs that Google considers the most high quality and have already established their own eat online. Then poke around their sites. And you can also look at sources like Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram until you find other bloggers in your niche that match your brand. And that's not just a good way to find new bloggers. It's also a really great way to find potential readers for your own blog. So while you're there, try following some of the people who follow these blogs, seeing which posts work best, and learning from your peers. Once you've found the right blogs, it's time to reach out and start creating your network. So here are some ways I personally like to connect with other bloggers and form those meaningful relationships. First, start by engaging with their content. If you like what you see, let them know. Leave comments, like posts, retweet their articles, and share to your own channels. But just make sure to do it in a way that feels sociable and genuine. Everybody loves their fans, but no one likes to feel like they're being spammed. Another idea is checking out forums like Reddit and Quora. Say someone has a question about a topic that you've written about, Comment with a link in a way that's helpful, casual, and definitely doesn't feel too promotional, but still directs them back to your site for answers. It might help you get noticed as an authority. And here's another idea. Reach out directly to your favorite bloggers in a way that feels most natural to you. We all have our own style. If you've been engaging with them on Instagram, go ahead and send them a DM. If you've been subscribing to their newsletter, send them an email yourself. And don't be afraid to tell them about your blog and ask for advice where you need it. As bloggers, we've all been exactly where you are right now and know exactly what it's like to get started and find your footing. And not to mention, it's pretty flattering to hear from people who admire your work. So once you've reached out and established those relationships, you can move on to the next step, or my favorite part. It's time to leverage those new relationships to your advantage, and the best way to do that is by guest posting. That's when either you write content for another blog or another blog writes content for yours. And that way, you combine both of your expertise, authority, and trustworthiness, there it is again, and boost your, you guessed it, eat scores. So reach out to other bloggers that you formed relationships with and ask them if they want to collaborate. It'll benefit both of you. Maybe your new collaborators will have their own creative spin for your blog, something you've never even tried before. Or maybe you can pitch them an idea that you've already had in mind. Like, if a friend of mine is based in Portland, maybe I'll ask them to review the food truck scene there. Whatever it is, the two of you will be working together to boost your eat scores and your guest bloggers, so it's a win-win. To add an author to my site, I'll just go to my dashboard, click Blog from that menu over at the side, and when you get to this screen, click More Actions at the top, and then select Blog Settings. It'll bring you to this page, where you can add contributors or authors to your blog. The difference here is that contributors have permissions to manage or edit parts of your site, but authors will only be able to contribute posts. So choose authors and type in their name, title, and you can even add a picture in there too. And that will let you assign their byline to any of the posts that they write for your site. And once you create a members area for your blog, which we'll get to in lesson 11, you can even use the same process to give your own readers the ability to contribute posts too. So once you follow those pretty easy steps, you can get yourself closer to becoming a recognized expert in your field. That way, the next time you share a blog post, you'll be recognized as an authority, not just from your own readers, but through your collaborators fan base as well, and through Google, thanks to that fancy new eat score you have. That is how you connect with other bloggers and climb up that SERP. Now go out there, make some friends, and see the results. Analytics. The word might sound intimidating, but it really just means looking at data. So as writers, why does the word seem so overwhelming? Today, I'm gonna to take away some of the mystery surrounding analytics and teach you how to look into helpful data points for your blog. Like who's reading my stuff, when, for how long, and other information that helps you get into the mind of your readers. I'll teach you how to get insights from Wix Analytics and how to set up Google Analytics and Google Search Console as a few added ways to track user behavior. And there's a lot to cover, so let's get started. Let's 
Let's start with Wix Analytics, since it's already integrated into your blog dashboard. To get to it, go to the dashboard and select Analytics and Reports. And here I can check things like traffic, sales, how people interact with my site, and more. And all of this data will help me understand the people I'm blogging for, my audience. As a blogger, this is super helpful for me to get a feel for what's working and what might need a little bit of refreshing. The Traffic Overview tab shows me my total number of site sessions, or clicks, on my site. Unique visitors are how many people visited my site at least once, and average session duration represents the time readers spent on my site. I can also view trends for my traffic over time and see where in the world my readers are located. Data like this can show me where my content is really connecting with readers. Like, I see I have a bunch of readers in Texas. Cool, so next month I'll review some classic Austin barbecue. Looking at numbers helps you prioritize your work and cater it to your specific audience. At Wix, we use something called the Shark Tank method. And what it means is that we label stories that have performed well or that we think will perform well with a shark emoji. Yes, really, shark emoji. It's just an easy identification process. And that way, we know which posts are working well or have the potential to work well, and we can then prioritize these posts and update them more frequently. So that's one way of using analytics. But if you're selling merch related to your blog, there's also a sales overview tab, and that gives you details like number of orders and average order value. You can track your revenue over time and even your best-selling items so you know where to direct your focus. And now to people overview. This is a really cool feature because you can see who your visitors are and what they do on your site. Clicking over here, I can also download detailed reports if I want to get more into the weeds of my data. And over in Insights, I can see ways that I can improve traffic to make my blog even stronger. And with the Benchmark tab, I can even compare Truck It to other food blogs to better understand where I stand compared to my competition. Over here, Site Speeds gives me performance metrics like page loading time, and this one is really important. Keep an eye on this because conversion rates drop by more than 4% with each additional second it takes for your site to load. Think about that. One, two, three, four, five. There's 20% of my readership gone just like that. And to make sure I don't miss out on any more readership, I can also set up alerts, which will email me anytime there's a dramatic change in my blog activity that I need to be made aware of. And over here where it says email updates, this will send me a monthly digest of all of my site's performance numbers, like an analytics newsletter. It's a really great way to compound everything into one place, so I can draw some conclusions about what worked and what didn't and plan next steps. Okay, that's Wix Analytics. Now on to Google. With Google Analytics, you can get an even deeper understanding of how readers get to your site, what they do while they're there, and where they go afterwards. Essentially, you could see the path to and from your site when readers search online. It's pretty cool. To set up Google Analytics, I'll need to create an account for my site and specify my data sharing settings. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Then I'll add my time zone, type in my preferred currency, and some info about my blog. What I'm doing here is I'm basically selecting how I intend to use Google Analytics. When I'm done with that, I'm going to keep this tab open because I'm going to be needing it soon. Next, I'll need to connect Google Analytics to my blog so it knows what it's reading and analyzing. Head to Marketing and SEO, then Marketing Integration. Select Google Analytics and click Connect. I'll follow the detailed step-by-step -step instructions in the dashboard until I get my analytics report. That report will automatically generate a property, or Google Analytics ID. And this ID contains all of the analytics and data info from my site. So copy that property and go back to my Google Analytics tab that I kept open, and then select Connect Google Analytics up top. I'll go ahead and just paste in that ID into the field right here. And then I'll select IP anonymization, so you can protect your visitor's IP info. And then press Save. Now that my blog is connected to Google Analytics, it'll take 24 hours for my site data to appear. But once it does, I'll be able to track my site analytics in real time. Now, Google Analytics works similarly to Wix Analytics, so I won't go into too much detail. But if you want to play around with the reports, you'll see that it goes a bit more in depth into user behavior and traffic. This helps you get an idea of what holds your reader's interest and what pages might need a little bit more work to get there. Now, on to the last analytics tool I'll show you today.
Let's talk Google Search Console. This tool gives you the data you need to improve your site performance on Google Search. And I can learn what readers are searching for, which keywords work best for me, like we discussed in lesson three, and things like that. But before I can get into it, I have to verify my site with Google by proving that I'm the true owner of Truckit. Remember that SEO whiz we did back in lesson five? If you've gone through that process and completed your SEO plan, you're already verified with Google. If not, you can manually verify your site pretty quickly. Go to Google Search Console, select URL prefix property, and type in the URL for your blog. Under HTML, I'll click the dropdown to expand, and then I'll click Copy to get my meta tag code, and then Save. Once I've added these tags, Google Search Console can verify that I own the site so I can start analyzing my data and see things like what my readers search to get to my site. So I know I mentioned before that analytics just means looking at data, but if you play the analytics game right, it's all about what you do with that data. So take any information you can get and leverage it to make the right moves for your blog and your audience. Getting to know who they are helps you get to know how you can best serve them. So time is money and I'll just get right into it. There is this common misconception that you have to be among the biggest bloggers to earn any kind of living off your blog. But I am here to debunk all of that because even if you're just starting out, there are a ton of ways to start earning a living off your blog. So in this lesson, I'm gonna break down how you can monetize your blog in three ways. By offering professional services, by partnering with affiliates, and by creating sponsored content. Now, you might be thinking, hold up, Kendall, are we talking about real money or cover my monthly Netflix subscription money? So no, I'm talking about actual full-time income from blogging. Some studies have shown that bloggers can make upwards of $100,000 annually after only two years of building traffic and a solid subscriber base. Crazy, right? $100,000 a year just from blogging. Now, I'm not saying you have to quit your day job. Blogging can also earn you a nice passive income too. Studies have shown that bloggers can earn an extra $500 to $2,000 a month, even in their first year. And that's some pretty good extra cash. So let's start making money. And just a heads up before we get into it, you'll need to upgrade to a Wix premium plan to start earning money off of your blog. So if you haven't, go ahead and do that now and I'll meet you back here. Are there certain types of blogs that are more likely to earn you money? Yes. At Wix, we found that these are some of the top earning categories for blogs right now. They include business and finance, marketing, health, nutrition and food, lifestyle, fashion, and DIY and crafts. If your blog doesn't fall under one of these categories though, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean that you can't earn money off your blog. No matter the focus, there are a ton of ways to offer professional services that work with your blog's topic and audience. So here's an example. With my blog, Truck It, I could offer consulting services for other food truck bloggers or sell an ebook of my favorite food truck recipes. Just brainstorm ideas and see if they work with your topic. So let's try it with one of the top earning categories I just mentioned and come up with some ways that each one could turn a profit. For business and finance blogs, you can create and sell downloadable guides and financial planning or budgeting templates. Keep in mind, if you're still growing your audience, it's a good idea to offer some of your guides for free to new subscribers. For health, nutrition, and food blogs, you can offer and sell downloadable recipes, cookbooks, or weight loss and meal plans, or even sell access to some of your workout videos. And for DIY and craft blogs, try video courses or how-to guides where you walk viewers through a project step-by-step. -step. When it comes to finding the right thing for you and your blog, think about the content you download and what you think would be a natural extension of your own brand. Also, take a look at what your competitors are doing and then try to take it a step further to make it your own. Whatever you offer should add real value and deliver on whatever promises you're making when you make the sale to your audience. Giving readers the feeling that they've been misled or overpromised is the fastest way to lose their loyalty, so be aware of that. But let's talk some other money-making ideas. So most successful monetized blogs have tapped into the power of affiliate marketing. But what is affiliate marketing, really? It's connecting with other bloggers or retails in related niches and agreeing to mention their products or content on your site for a price. And it works. 61% of online shoppers in the US say that they've made purchases after reading a blog post. So it's really a win-win. 
How this works is that within your blog post, you'll include links to other brands' pages, and then they'll get feedback on how much traffic you brought to their site and pay you based on that. Your partner gets an increase in traffic, your readers get more of what they love, and you get paid. Sounds pretty good. The commissions you get are typically based on the number of clicks, signups, purchases, or any combination of them. So I could promote food festivals on my site and get a commission every time someone buys a ticket, or I could promote a specific truck. And to do that, I could just reach out to potential affiliates with the idea, lock in a special promo code for my readers, and get a commission every time someone uses that code to buy something. If you're having trouble landing an affiliate, check out sites like CJ Affiliate and Share a Sale. They have huge networks of potential partners and can connect you based on your industry, your niche, your reader's interest, and site size. Once you do partner up with someone, make sure to hammer out the details of your agreements. Deliverables, deadlines, payments, all of these are important. Lock in all the specifics before you start your professional relationship together. Because remember, it's still about offering value to your readers, not straight up advertising for advertising's sake. So be picky with who you partner with because they'll become an extension of your entire brand. And keep that in mind as we move on to this next money-making method. Sponsored posts are another really smart way to bring in some revenue for your blog. The whole process is a lot like partnering with affiliates. But rather than having your income be based on clicks, like with affiliate marketing, sponsorships usually involve one payment upfront for your blog or social media post. So you can take the guesswork out of your paycheck. But here are some things to keep in mind when you're running sponsorships. If you can, try to look for series sponsorships or deals where you can create multiple posts and get paid more. And when you reach out, explain to them why they should sponsor your blog. Tell them about your audience or what sets you apart. Don't try to hide your sponsorships from readers. Be upfront and honest about disclosing them. And no matter what, don't compromise your own voice or integrity. Only sponsor products you believe in and only say what you believe to. Otherwise, it could hurt your relationship and trust with your readers. Here's another. Don't wait around for sponsorships to come to you. Take initiative by reaching out yourself to companies you want to partner with. Show them some of those affiliate marketing results and traffic numbers to show potential sponsors the benefits of partnering with you. So these are just three ways to make money and earn a living off of your blog. And you don't have to be a famous blogger to do any of them. But if you want to get even more ideas on this, we have a whole list of creative ways to make money by blogging on the Wix blog. And I've linked to it in the resources and activities tab. Say I usually send an email newsletter to 10 people, but then one month I decide to expand that list to 100. It's the same output, the same cost to me, but I expend my reach tenfold. That's scaling, and it's the key to growing your blog into a thriving brand. In this lesson, we're talking scaling. I'm gonna walk you through a few ways that you can scale your blog to make the most impact at the lowest cost. So let's get started. You've probably heard people talk about scaling their business, but what does it actually mean and how is it different from growing your business? When you're growing a business, you do things like hire more people, open new offices, things that require larger actions, higher costs, and more resources to increase your revenue. Scaling, on the other hand, is when you make smaller, less costly changes or tweaks, like reallocating your time and effort differently. It's essentially working smarter to reach your goals while still increasing your revenue. We're gonna talk about two methods today, scaling by building your audience and scaling by strengthening your connection with your existing audience. So let's start with the first way. I already talked about how to create a posting schedule back in lesson four, and in that lesson, I recommended posting three to four times a week. That's enough to help Google recognize that your blog is legit and active. And that's great in theory, but how do you stick to that kind of output? You can try to reach out to other bloggers in your industry and ask them to write a guest post, like we talked about in Lesson 8. It's a free way to scale, but what if they're busy and they have their own blogs to keep up with? So what if you're looking for someone to take on a heavier lift? This is where freelancers come in. Hiring a freelancer is a relatively cheap way to increase output without bringing on a full-time writer. The key is to hire strategically. Like for the Truckit blog, I'd look into hiring freelancers from the top three food truck cities, Portland, Denver, and Orlando. And that way I know there's a ton of content and I don't have to fly out myself. And with 59 million Americans performing freelance work in 2020 alone, 
more than half of the working Gen Z population, there's plenty of talent to choose from. To find the best fit for you, I'd say check out sites like Upwork, Fiverr, Indeed, or Freelancer.com to see what kind of talent's out there. Just a note here, write up a brief with any style guides, SEO keywords, or points you'd like your freelancers to reach. It'll help streamline the process. But if that doesn't work for you, here are a few other ways to step up your content output. Try turning it around and freelancing for bigger blogs or magazines yourself to expand your audience. And don't worry, that doesn't necessarily mean giving yourself more work. I can do things like repackage my own content into something like, let's say, an article about 20 best food trucks in the US. Then I can pitch that to blogs and add it to my own, two for one. I can also try creating a listing for myself on any of the freelancer websites, and I can mention my blog within whatever I'm hired to write. And don't stop there. You can even reach out and pitch an idea to your favorite publications yourself. You might not always hear back, but if you do, it can turn into a really awesome opportunity. And rule of thumb, whenever you freelance, just remember to link back to your blog because that'll help bring in some new readers. But the scaling journey doesn't just end with getting new readers. Another way to scale is by strengthening the connection you already have with your audience. Stronger connections mean more loyal readers and they're more likely to buy your products and spread the word about your blog. Plus, having more members and followers will help you land more affiliate deals. So here's how I do that. A member's area on your blog is a great way to build up that loyal base. And no, this isn't some type of velvet, roped off section of a club. A member's area is a place within your blog that lets readers log in and get benefits. That might be extra content or a forum to connect with other members, whatever you think will attract your audience. You know them best. Here's how to create one. Most of the Wix templates come with a member's area already installed, but in case you need to add one, it won't take too long. Just go to your editor, click Add Apps, and search for Wix Members Area, and add in that first option you see. And that's it. See? Told you it was easy. Back to my site, here's what my account page will look like, and now you can see there's a new login bar at the top. And I'll move that so that it looks okay with the rest of my site design. Under that, there's a member profile card, where your readers can add a profile picture and a username, and I can add different badges for my top users. So I'll click here, select badges and create badges. These can be badges for anything you want, like top commenter, top reader, conversation starter. It helps encourage your readers to engage with your blog. Great, so X out of there, and this is where my members will fill out their details. But really, I don't think I need all of this information. As I mentioned before, it'll only make people less likely to fill out the form. So I can go to my settings, click Manage Fields and add, delete, or move any of these form fields so that you only get the information you need. But I'd keep the email address and the first name. Because as soon as members fill out this form, all of that information will be automatically added to my contact list so I can reach out to them whenever. So that's what it looks like on my end, but here's what it looks like for my readers. From Page, click Profile under Members Pages. Here's where I can see what my members' profiles will look like, and over in Settings, they can customize their own alerts for every comment, like, post, or whatever they want to create their own experience with your blog. But as I said before, when it comes to a member's area, you have to give readers a reason to join it. It's best to have a game plan for how you'll get their attention, and that's all about perks. So go ahead and offer exclusive content, extended articles, free downloads, special discounts, merch, whatever you think will most attract your readers. Okay, let's review. If you want to scale your blog, post regularly, collaborate with other bloggers, take advantage of freelance opportunities, whether that means hiring your own or doing some of that freelance work yourself. And within your blog, build a community that you can leverage to land some of those coveted, high-paid sponsorships and affiliates. These are just a few tips, but different things work for different people. So try them out and see what works for you. Whatever helps you work smarter. From pickle of the month clubs to a monthly box of curated car fresheners, people can subscribe to just about anything these days, including your blog. By adding subscription plans to your blog, you could be locking in some solid recurring revenue. But with all of the options out there, you need to make sure that you're offering the right things to the right people at the right price. Let me show you how. 
By the end of 2021, an estimated 2 billion people will have bought something online. That's one fourth of the planet and a huge potential customer base. And before I dive in, you'll have to have a premium account to add subscription plans to your site. So if you haven't done so, go ahead and upgrade. And once you've done that, I'll meet you back here for the next steps, connecting payment options. So I'll head to settings, then e-commerce and accept payments. And from here, it'll ask you to fill out some basic information like your location, preferred payment methods, things like that. And I've already done it, but go ahead and take a few minutes to do that now. Once you're done, I wanna add my pricing plans or different levels of subscriptions. From my editor, I can go to add apps and then search for pricing plans. And then select that first option, Wix pricing plans. This will take me back to my site where I can manage my plans. Click on this and a new dashboard will pop up. So we'll start with creating a plan. First, it'll ask me to name it. While you can definitely choose something self-explanatory like naming my plan by cost or by your standard tiers that we've all seen before, I can also go with something a little more fun and related to my niche to give my site a bit more personality. No matter what you go with, I wouldn't offer more than two or three plans so that you don't overwhelm readers with too many options. I'm gonna go with the fun option for now, so I'll add my name in right here. Next, I have to list what's included in any specific plan. Exclusive blog posts are an easy way to extend the work that I'm already doing and earn extra revenue off of it. I can offer an extra post every week, another angle off of an experience, review a different dish from the same truck, or even offer a virtual meetup or cooking class. These options seem like a good place to start for now, and like I said, I can always adjust my pricing and what I offer for each plan whenever I want. Now I'll go into Connect and Manage Benefits, where I can select which of my articles will be included in this MasterChef package. After that, I have pricing and duration. So this is where I can set if it's a one-time payment or a recurring plan and how long those plans will last. There's been research that actually shows that companies who update their pricing plans every quarter see nearly double the average revenue per user. So keep your pricing flexible. Don't set it and forget it. Keep checking in and making sure your pricing is fair and increase it when your content improves and grows. For Truckit, I'll start with an $8 a month subscription for my MasterChef subscribers since it's my top level option and it's gonna take a little bit more work on my end. For length of plan, I'll choose until canceled and I'm gonna choose this free trial option so readers can test out a subscription plan for let's say 14 days before deciding if they want in. I'll just quickly check that everything looks the way that I want in my preview, spelling, what I'm promising my readers and done. So that's how I set up subscriptions. But before I go, I have one last tip. I personally love to make Facebook groups for my blog subscribers. It creates this really awesome community where my readers can connect with each other and share tips, experiences, photos. Plus, it helps them forge a deeper connection with my blog. And the more they connect with your community, the more reason they'll want to renew their subscriptions every year. Then sometimes I'll mention a funny conversation or interesting discussion that happened on the subscribers Facebook group so that readers who haven't joined feel a little bit of that FOMO and want in. Putting ads on your blog is one of the easiest ways to make money off your site. In this lesson, we'll talk paid ads, what kind to put on your blog, what best practices to keep in mind, and how to set them up. I'll walk you through connecting Google AdSense and we'll get the steps out of the way so that you can start earning a steady stream of passive income. Sound good? Let's get started. So Google AdSense works kind of like a dating app for online ads. Your blog has a list of characteristics, like its readership and topic, and you're looking for potential advertisers. Meanwhile, advertisers that have already been vetted by Google are looking for the perfect sites to place their ads, with readers and specific topics in mind. Google AdSense plays Cupid here and matches your site with the right advertisers and vice versa. It's a modern day match made in blogging heaven. And speaking of heaven, Google will pay you a commission every time your readers click on an ad. Of course, the payouts depend on a lot of factors, like how much traffic you get and what kind of content you provide. But there is a very handy revenue calculator on the AdSense site that can give you a general idea of what you could make. And whatever you do make, you'll get paid direct deposits monthly to your account as long as you've made over $100. So it can become a pretty nice extra paycheck. 
So now that you've decided that you want to get started with AdSense, here's how. Before you get started, you'll need to have a personalized domain name. So if you haven't done that yet, go ahead and make sure you have one. Okay, so I'll just fill out my info right at the top. And since this is newish terrain for me, I definitely want to sign up for tips and advice. And I can always opt out later. Next, I'll select my country or territory. And this is really important because it determines which ads my readers will get. And scroll down here to create account. Next, it'll ask you to put in details, like how exactly Google can pay you for those ads. So go ahead and fill that information out. And once you do that, I get a custom AdSense code made specifically for my blog. Now, I'll copy this code here, and I'll leave this tab open because I'll be coming back to it. So in a new tab, I'll open up my dashboard, and I'll go to Settings, Advanced, and then Custom Code. All right, I'll click Add Custom Code right here. I'll paste in my AdSense code and give it a name. Your best bet here is to pick something really simple so that you remember what it is. Under Add Code to Pages, this is where you choose where you want the ads to show up. I'll click All Pages so that I'm covered on all fronts and choose Load Code Once. Finally, I'll put my personalized code in the head of my site pages. Then click Apply to save. OK, back to that Google AdSense tab I left open. We're just going to confirm that everything's good to go. I'll check the box at the bottom of my Google window just to confirm that I've pasted my code into my site. And Google will now double check my work, confirm that everything's in order, and let me know that they're reviewing my site. This step can take anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, but don't stress. This just gives you some more time to hammer out some more blog posts. Once you get your notification from Google saying it's all ready, you can start creating and customizing your first ad space or unit. So now you'll want to go back to your Google AdSense account, click Ads, and select Buy Ad Unit, the tab up top. This is where I can decide what kind of ad I want to put on my blog. There's Display, In Feed, or In Article. Display ads work really well anywhere. They're one of the first ever types of ads, and they're usually the default for most advertisers, including Google. Plus, they'll automatically adapt their size to fit page layouts on all devices, so they'll always look good on your site. In-article ads fit between the text on your page like this. And in-feed ads are the ones that show up between the headline and the content on your blog feed. Some people prefer in-article or in-feed ads because they'll appear native on your site, meaning they'll match the look and feel of your blog for a more seamless user experience. You can let Google suggest styles for your ads or pick them yourself, but both of these can be customized for mobile and desktop. Because remember, more often than not, people are viewing your content from their phones. So which should I go with? For now, despite the buzz around native ads like InFeed and InArticle, I want to keep my blog's flow. So I'm going to go with Google's recommendation and stick with display ads. And now that I've picked that, I'll go and give my first ad unit a name. And I'll go with something like uh, truck it ad number one. And I like the look of the square display ads, so I'll just leave it like that. And under ad size, I'll click responsive, which means that my ads will adjust to any device and will change on a desktop if a reader makes their screen wider or more narrow. Looks good to me, so create. And there you go. AdSense Code Generator gives me another code snippet. But unlike my first snippet, which went into my header, this code is for the ads themselves. So they'll need to go into the body of my pages. So again, I'll copy the code, but make sure to keep this AdSense tab open. And I'll go back to my dashboard in another tab. Again, this is the screen you get to when you click Settings, Advanced, and then Code Settings. This time, I'll go down to the body and start to insert my code in there. And I'll click Add Code and paste in my new snippet. But here, I'll have to do one extra thing, the only real bit of coding that we'll do. So go to the fifth line of this code, where it looks like this. I need to add my own bit of code. I'll type this in right here on that fifth line after where it says Ads by Google. So type in data-page-url equals plus your blog's full domain name, remembering to keep that little HTTPS bit in there. And that's it. That's all the coding you'll have to do today. So again, I'll name my code and keep it set to Add Code to All Pages and Load Code Once, and Apply. Now that I'm done adding the display ads code to my site, I need to go back to that AdSense tab I left open just to confirm that I'm done. 
And this is the last bit of jumping around that we'll do. Just to make sure it all worked, I'll look here where it says existing ad units and see my first units right there. Now for my final tip of this lesson, and it's a big one. Test out your ads. Test out the placement, the shape, the styling, the color choices, all of it. These may seem like small things, but badly formatted ads are enough to make your readers want to leave the page. Tweaks here and there can be the deciding factor in whether or not your ad performs well and makes you money. So take the time and look over your data. But as you're doing that, only test one variable at a time, like test out a display ad versus an in-article ad, but leave everything else the same. Give it a few weeks and see if there's a measurable improvement in traffic. And now that you're all set up and you can add Coder to your resumes, you can start earning even more money off of your blog. But that doesn't mean your work is done. There's yet another way to continue monetizing your blog. I'm talking about setting up a full-blown blog store. The year is 1994. Friends premieres on NBC, Whoopi Goldberg is hosting the Academy Awards, and a guy named Dan Kahn makes history just for selling a CD-ROM. That's right. Dan Kahn sold a Sting CD to a buddy for $12.48 and completed the first ever online shopping transaction. Since then, things have evolved to say the least, and shopping online has expanded way beyond Sting CDs. It's now become an essential part of most businesses. So in this lesson, you'll learn how to launch your online store and start selling products through your own blog. So let's get started. If you don't have your own products for your blog yet, no worries. Setting that up is really easy. I'm gonna show you how to quickly set up drop shipping for your blog. And drop shipping is a method that lets you sell custom design products without worrying about merchandising, warehousing, shipping, or any of the other headaches that come with running your own store. You design the product and get someone else to print and ship it for you. So from my editor, I'm gonna to go to the app market and type print on demand. And then I'll click on that option that says print fold to add it to my site. It'll ask you to fill out some basic information about yourself to create an account, and then it'll take you to this dashboard. This is where you'll eventually keep track of all your orders, see what's selling, and of course, create your custom merch. And here's the cool part. Once you click on the product catalog down at the bottom, you can see all of the things that you could start selling on your site. And it has pretty much everything. T-shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, towels, stickers, even a beanbag chair. I can also click on an item and see the prices, reviews, and examples of what some other stores have done. Once you pick a product, you can start designing it. Slap your logo on there, match the colors to your branding, whatever you want to get cool custom merch to offer to your readers. So now that you have the products, let's open up your online store for business. We'll start by adding a few products that are a good fit for Truckit. And to do that, I'll go to Add Apps, search Wix Stores, and add it to my site. I can start adding products here, and I think I'll start with the trucker hat, the shining star of my brand dedicated to food trucks. First, I'll add in a picture from my site files. It's one of the designs I customize for drop shipping. And I'll add in some of the product details, like a name, a price, a short description, and a bit about what it's made of. Add in as much information as possible here to answer all of your shoppers' potential questions. And if it's made out of organic or high quality materials, let them know. Scrolling down to list color options, I'll head to option name and enter color. And then I'll type out what's available. So black, white, and lime, separating each with a comma. And look, part of having merch means a little bit of housekeeping. So adding a SKU or item ID number, shipping weights, and whether or not it's an item in stock, this is all important for shipping your products to your customers and keeping track of your inventory. When I finish with all of that, my product should immediately appear live in my online store. But what if what I'm selling isn't a physical item? Here's how I do that. Since this is the digital age after all, you don't only want to be offering physical products on your store. You can also offer all kinds of online options like eBooks, classes, audio files, instructional videos, printable guides, just to name a few. But I want one that's on brand for me. So from my product page, I'll add a new product, and this time I'll click digital file. 
From here, the process is almost identical, except this time I have to upload the digital product itself so that it's immediately available whenever anyone buys it. In this case, I'll add a Truckit digital file cookbook from my files, and it's got great images, detailed instructions, and commentary from my readers. It's the perfect combination of the things I want my brand to be. Again, I'll add my product info, just like last time, and I'll copy and paste that right in here with all of the information my readers could possibly need. Down under that, I'll also add my inventory and shipping information. Even though it's a digital file and it won't need shipping, adding this here helps me keep track of my inventory through my dashboard. Then again, I'll add some images, like a cover, recipe, things like that, and this will just show up as the thumbnail for the product. Then, just add to the store the same way you did with your physical product. But I also wanna show you a few extra tools that you have in your toolbox here. Here's one of my favorite, not so secret weapons, guaranteed to draw attention. So use it well. It's the product ribbon. Something like bestseller, new, limited edition, these types of ribbons help draw attention to specific products. And if I have a lot of products, I can group them by collection to make my site easier to navigate. I also have access to marketing tools here, like coupons, promo videos, and email marketing to get the word out about my products. And remember email marketing back in Lesson 7? 60% of consumers say they've purchased an item as a result of email marketing. So feel free to feature some of the products on your monthly newsletters or send out an email just to tell your readers what's new in your store. And finally, once you've uploaded your merch to your store, it's time to start promoting it online. And I'm not talking about taking a picture of the product and posting it. I mean getting creative. Maybe I'll wear the truck and hat every single photo I'm in for a week. Or maybe I'll offer a sweet deal on a cookbook around Memorial Day when my readers are ramping up for summer cookouts. Because online stores that build a presence across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter have 32% more sales than those that don't. So take the time to think through how you want to promote your swag. Give the product to your friends and have them tag your blog, or ask your blogger friends who made in Lesson 8 to show it off. Whatever you have to do to put your name and your products out there. While we might have come a long way from that Sting CD sale back in 1994, the principle remains the same. Online shopping depends on giving your users products they want and need, and getting those products in front of the right people. So now that you're open for business, that wraps up this lesson. And we're just about finished the course, but I wanna share some final thoughts with you before you go. In this course, we created a blog from the ground up, from choosing a topic and a name to opening a store. We've strategically designed landing pages and formatted articles. We've created marketing campaigns on email and social to grow our readership. And then we leverage that readership using SEO and analytics to make real money off of our blogs. But here's the thing I wanna highlight. With all of these steps happening, no matter which part of the process you're in, your content should always be at the center of it. Whether you're monetizing, promoting, anything, content is key. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a writer. Your SEO might help people find your page, your design might draw them in, but what will keep your readers subscribing, coming back, buying your merchandise, that is content, so don't let it get overshadowed. And whenever you're writing content, make sure you're always keeping your audience and your own goals in mind. Let those two things be what drives you and your brand. Okay, with that, thanks for watching. And if you wanna keep your learning going, take a look at our full course list, where we go a bit deeper into some of the topics we talked about here. And with that, class dismissed. Oh, 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 oh,